All right, let's see these fine publications and their Big Ten power rankings. And we'll see if we can poke holes in these. We have the fine folks at Athlon Sports. And who wants to bet as we look at three different power ranking sets that these are almost going to be identical? Ohio State's number one. Ohio State is almost a consensus number one in college football from what I've seen. And certainly Athlons is not going to tell us anything we didn't know. They did a phenomenal job bringing in talent in the offseason with Caleb Downs. On the defensive side, it's safety. And then, of course, Will Howard at quarterback, Quinshawn Judkins at running back. And I'm going to say just as important as Ohio State's work in the transfer portal was Ohio State's recruiting and NIL initiative to keep players from going to the NFL draft. They could have been just torn apart. The projection was that this was going to be Ohio State's big NFL draft in 2024. Well, that's coming in 2025 because guys like Jack Sawyer, JT Tuimolau, and Emeka Buka, and uh, who am I thinking of? My goodness, I'm blanking on the corner. Their best cornerback. Good Lord. Uh, I'm in trouble if I can't come up with that name tonight. Anyway, uh, <laughs> oh, my word. All right, Oregon coming up here next. Deep roster, four to five with a couple of transfers. Uh, the more I look into Oregon, and I got a deep dive position by position with Spencer McLaughlin from Locked on Ducks a few weeks ago as we went through Oregon, and we went for an hour on Oregon personnel. Check out the videos on the Ducks channel. I'm really impressed with Oregon. I am going to, at this point, if my mindset is still the same in August, I will highly consider Oregon to win the Big Ten Championship. If you figure they're as good as Ohio State or close to Ohio State, consider these two aspects of the race. One would be, of course, Oregon plays Ohio State at home in one of the more difficult places to play in all of college football. Now, I don't predict conference races based on where games are. And this is an issue that I see all over the place with people making predictions. It's ridiculous. I see this every year. I will go through people's predictions because I am, for as much as I don't watch other people's channels or don't go on sites, when it's August and there are predictions, I'm kind of a sucker to look at the predictions and see. Sometimes I have my weak moments. And what I notice is there's this focus all the time on where the games are. I may actually do a video series on home field advantage. And I may be wrong. I may be wrong. Yes, there is home field advantage. It exists. Absolutely. It doesn't exist as much as people think it does. I see people generally make predictions. And then any toss-up game, they simply just default to the home team. Oh, uh, Penn State's at Ohio State. Okay, that game. Ohio State, Michigan. Since Michigan's been good, since they've elevated, a lot of people have just defaulted. Oh, they're in Columbus this year. Ohio State's going to win. Oh, they're in Michigan. Michigan's going to win. And they do that with every conference. Alabama, LSU. Okay, they're in Death Valley this year. Okay, LSU, I'm going to pin them to pull off a slight upset. Clemson, Florida State, okay, they're in Tallahassee. Florida State's going to win. Not really. It is a consideration. It means something, absolutely. 
it means about 55-45 on average. And maybe for the really, really tough places to play, 60-40. That doesn't mean that LSU, Ohio State, Alabama only win 60% of the games at home. Obviously not. They win 90-some percent of their games at home. But they they are going to walk through most of those teams anyway. That means we'd have to come up with some kind of formula. And really, this is for a mathematician to figure out to the hilt. But we'd have to figure out some type of statistical formula of how many times Well, we could basically, this would be slightly skewed, not not in any particular direction, but it's slightly, uh, what's what's the statistical polling term for it? Uh, the, The variation or the deviation would be not exact to where you would want it to be, but you could basically take every game that involved a difference in record, a difference in the record for those two teams by the end of the season, and then just count up the number of times that the home team with a worse record won the game, meaning that by the end of the season, the team that's better should have a better record. Therefore, how many times did home field come into advantage to determine a team with a lesser record, a worse record to pull off the upset at home against a better team versus how many times did that happen on the road? And I guarantee over time that there are more upsets pulled off at home than on the road. Correct. However, not as many as you would think. It's not like for every 100 upsets in college football, 89 of them are pulled off by the home team and 11 from the road team. Mm, 60-40. So again, these folks at Athlon have Oregon number two. I'm impressed with the Ducks. I think their defensive line's a bit thin. Michigan. Good call by Athlons, I believe, right here. I believe that Michigan is certainly in contention for a Big Ten championship. I'm going on record right now that I will be considering Michigan to win the Big Ten this year. Elite defense, once again, yes, they lost 13 players to the NFL. I think Michigan people have overplayed the depth, the development, and the culture and the recruiting gems, the recruiting diamonds in the rough, not the recruiting rankings, they've overplayed it from one end of the spectrum to basically say, ah, it's going to be easy to replace all these guys. Michigan detractors, Michigan haters, and just general college football people have taken the exact opposite lean, which is in air as well. That Michigan's going to fall apart. They don't have Jim Harbaugh anymore, J.J. McCarthy, Blake Corum. They lost a lot of great players on defense. Their linebackers, Mike Sandra still, et cetera. Forget it. They're top two receivers. If any team in America could get away with not having the best wide receivers, it would be this team right here. However, Sharon Moore has never been a head coach. That would be another interesting stuff. I I got to start jotting down these ideas because here's the next one. How successful are first year head coaches who have never been a head coach before? Hmm. First-year head coaches in the Power Five who have never been a head coach. Do we have anyone like that currently in the Big Ten outside of Sharon Moore? Mike Loxley, head coach. Kurt Signetti, head coach. Greg Schiano, head coach. Ryan Day, never a head coach. Took over a fairly talented roster, albeit. So 
that that's a bit of an aberration right there in regards to uh, the system and the culture and the roster that he took over being one of the best in America. However, we would have to include it in our review. Ryan Day would be the one coach. Uh, of course, David Braun at Northwestern, never a head coach, went eight and five last year, did a remarkable job, should be the coach of the year nationally. I don't know how that wound up, if it was Kalen DeBoer or if it was David Braun or possibly Mike Norvell. Whoever won the coach of the year last year, I believe it should have gone to David Braun. So we've got Day, Braun, and I believe everyone else in the Big Ten, Luke Fickle, Matt Rule, P.J. Fleck, Kirk Ferentz, never, hmm, we'd have to differentiate between maybe never a, hmm, never a head coach, period, or never an FBS head coach. So that would be the determination to make. But that could be an interesting lineup of coaches to review. First-time head coaches and how they fared. Elsewhere in the Big Ten, Penn State. And we know from reviewing the last 10 years with the 14 playoff that there is no team in college football, no program in college football, no coach in college football, James Franklin, who will, well, we don't know if they will, but they would have benefited from the 12 team playoff as much as Penn State. Penn State would have reached a 12 team playoff more than Michigan. I believe the numbers were, in the last 10 years, Ohio State 10, of course, Penn State 6, Michigan 5. And then the other teams that would have reached a 12-team playoff would have been Iowa in 2015, Michigan State in 2014, in addition to, of course, making it in 2015. Wisconsin in 20, they would have been borderline after they got blown out by Ohio State in the Big Ten Championship in 2014, and Wisconsin would have made it in 2017. Uh, think about the 2017 season. Wisconsin played Ohio State pretty tough in the Big Ten Championship game. They lost 27-21. They had the ball on the final drive, couldn't do anything with it, three and out, ball game. But if they could have somehow found a way to score a touchdown to win that game, they would have been in the college football playoff, and Alabama would have been out the eventual champion, and we would have had Clemson, Georgia, Oklahoma, Wisconsin. How about that? How about CFP near misses or what ifs? And what is the other idea I had for a video since we've been talking? There was a there was one about 10 minutes ago. Shoot. It'll come back to me. USC at number five. Uh, so I'm right on with the first five. I believe Ohio State has the best team of the Big Ten. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to win the Big Ten. A date at Oregon. So that could swing the whole conference race. In terms of, hmm, that could either swing the conference race if the loser of that game loses another game. Like if Ohio State goes out to Oregon, loses, and then loses to Michigan, look out. They may not make it. Uh, the, the, those games could obviously, there could just be a rematch. Uh, so with USC, you've got Miller Moss stepping in for Caleb Williams at quarterback. Uh, I have noticed uh, our buddy Tim Prangley, who of course uh, is the anchor of everything we do on the USC channel has been posting his photos on Instagram 
from USC spring practice. Excellent photos by Tim. Uh, but he is he is bullish on USC. No big surprise to anyone. Thinks USC is going to take the Big Ten by storm. Big concerns here. DeAnton Lynn, excellent defensive coordinator coming in from UCLA, has much work to do. Okay, number six is Iowa. And we know that Iowa's going to have a tremendous defense led by a linebacking core that might not just be the best in the Big Ten, but the best in college football. As is mentioned there, I certainly agree with that. Corey Bratta and myself have already discussed that. Tim Lester, the new defense or er, offensive coordinator. And what about the pickup this week of Brendan Sullivan? Moving from Northwestern to Iowa. Now, is he an insurance policy for Cade McNamara? Or just flat out, is there competition for the quarterback job at Iowa? I say the latter. If I am Iowa, in no way does Cade McNamara just automatically get the number one job. He has not earned it. He earned it at Michigan in 2021, three years ago at Michigan at another school. No, Brendan Sullivan to me is not an insurance policy for Cade McNamara. Brendan Sullivan is a viable candidate for the starting job at Iowa. He has thrown 200 passes in the Big Ten. He has completed 69% of his passes at Northwestern. So he has not received the most help of anyone in terms of skill position, talent around him. And he's also not going to get that kind of help at Iowa. But what he will have at Iowa that he did not have, in addition to a defense and a special teams that's going to keep them in every game where he doesn't have to score 35 points, he can score 17 points and win games. But in addition to that, one of the best linebacking or one of the best tight end rooms in college football and a great stable of running backs. The Iowa situation rests on the quarterback situation, whether that's the health of Cade McNamara or the ability of Brendan Sullivan to learn the offense, which I would think it would take about 40 minutes to learn the Iowa offense. And new coordinator Tim Lester has to be an enormous upgrade over Brian Ferentz. Number seven, Nebraska. True freshman five-star Dylan Rayola, of course, leading the offense, and his progression is going to be key. The rest of the team on both sides of the ball, I think, is strong, decent, capable, competent. I don't think there's an outstanding position group on that team, but there's not a weakness, a severe weakness. Now, Wisconsin, I would rank ahead of Nebraska right now. They only averaged 4.8 yards per snap in conference play in 2023. Tyler Van Dyke, again, if he, if you would show me Tyler Van Dyke's touchdown to pick ratio right now for 2024, I would have a pretty good read on what they would do this year. Lost Braylon Allen, Ches Malusi needs to stay healthy. Washington, this is the biggest wild card in the conference. New head coach, new coaching staff, new conference, new quarterback, and just about everyone's gone. Just about everyone's gone from this team. Quarterback, offensive line, receivers, defense, two starters back. Rutgers, the interesting. Storyline concerning Rutgers football is that Gavin Wimsat, who led them to a bowl victory last year for the first time in a decade, lost the starting job to the Minnesota transfer, Ethan Kalkimanis. So Rutgers is making a very clear distinction that they are going to run the running backs and the quarterback is going to be a passing quarterback from the pocket. They are going to be a much different offense than what they've been under Greg Schiano. Expect them to be a little bit more pass heavy and play action pass heavy. Playing off of that run game, 
But of course, Cal Kimanis is not a guy that's going to run around or present any kind of running threat. They don't have any called running plays for him. Nothing of the sort. Uh, so this is the change in philosophy that has caused Gavin Wimsett to transfer to Kentucky. At number 11, so according to Athlons, they like Rutgers over Maryland. Much of that has to do with the quarterback battle ensuing at Maryland with Talia Tunkabailoa gone and losing all five offensive line starters. MJ Morris, based on play in college, should be the starting quarterback in Maryland. It may turn out to be Billy Edwards. And there's also a third option there. But MJ Morris had some nice games at NC State. Uh, Maryland is a much better team on both sides of the line of scrimmage and were last year than they've ever been in the Big Ten. Michigan State with Jonathan Smith, of course. I've got tremendous respect for Jonathan Smith and all that he's done at Oregon State. He brings in Aiden Childs to play quarterback. They lost a couple standout defensive linemen in Simeon Barrow and Derek Harmon. They've transferred out after the spring sessions. Uh, Minnesota, this could be a rough, rough year. They lose their quarterback. Max Brosmer is probably just as good as Ethan Calcumanis. I think that's the projection. Tyler Newbin was one of the best players in the country on defense. Uh, they are heavily rely on a offensive line and running game, and they've got a brutal schedule. Illinois loses two of the biggest and best defensive players in the country. Johnny Newton, who went high in the NFL draft, and Keith Randolph. And they gave up 30 points per game in Big Ten play last year, and they lose their two best players. Luke Altmaier, back at quarterback, needs to be better, needs to take a step forward, needs to be the guy. And they've lost their number one wide receiver in Isaiah Williams. Uh, UCLA, look at how low UCLA is being projected, but I can't argue with that. Deshaun Foster is a first-time head coach. And again, this could be a video focus of mine in the next couple of weeks, looking at first-year head coaches and how well they've done. Return only nine starters. And Ethan Garbers at quarterback, most likely running back TJ Harden. Now he's really good. I ranked him as one of the 10 best running backs in the Big Ten. Northwestern lose Brendan Sullivan. David Braun did a remarkable job. Can he back it up? They have some of the highest production totals coming back from last season, but still don't get much respect. Indiana's at number 17. Uh, Curtis Rourke, the Ohio Bobcat quarterback, transferred to Indiana. Of course, this is Kurt Signetti, who did wonders at James Madison, taking over for Tom Allen. And Purdue, could Purdue be the worst team in the Big Ten? Hudson Card is back. Ryan Walters turned this from a pass-heavy Aiden O'Connell uh, offensive guru under Jeff Brom system to a very defensive-minded team, but they turned the ball over way too much for a non-explosive defensive-minded team. And yes, they've got a tough, tough schedule. This is courtesy CBS. Ohio State, number one, Oregon, two, Michigan, three, Penn State, four, USC, five. Exactly the same as Athlon, except Washington up to six instead of nine. Nebraska next, yes. Iowa down from six to eight, according to CBS Sports. But this was published before the addition of Brendan Sullivan, and there is a comment made here about Marco Lyonez, who's pretty much a forgotten man now that he's going to be the third string quarterback at Iowa, Wisconsin, Rutgers, Maryland, Michigan State, Illinois, 
Northwestern a bit higher in this ranking, Minnesota a bit lower, UCLA in the same spot, Purdue, Indiana last. That seems to make sense as well. Not too much difference there, again, except for Washington, three spots different. And then just randomly, why not hear from why not hear from Indiana on SB Nation? Because if you're going to talk Big Ten football, you are going to go to our friends at Indiana. So as soon as I can get this stuff off the board, there we go. And this is, what is the SB Nation site for Indiana? I can't even find their name. The Huddle. Okay. Ohio State, Oregon, Michigan, Penn State, USC. That's the same all over the place. Then it starts to change. Wisconsin, Iowa, Washington, Nebraska, pretty much in the same spot. Indy, whoa, ha, huh? what? Okay, we know we ran into an Indiana football site when we get this power ranking. Ohio State, Oregon, Michigan, Penn State, USC, Wisconsin, Iowa, Washington, Nebraska, Indiana at 10 because they had a successful spring game with no injuries and they are feverishly recruiting and signing needs from the transfer portal. Now let's give Indiana some credit. They somehow were able to get one of the biggest fish of the transfer portal cycle in Kent State defensive lineman C.J. West. I don't know if that justifies a number 10 power ranking in the Big Ten, but there it is. Look for the Hoosiers to come out swinging with the strong potential to go bowling by the end of the season. Well, if they're the number 10 team in the Big Ten, they are going bowling. Okay, that's, that's a homer move right there. I get hit up once in a while for making Homer moves, which I would argue I don't. But that Michigan State, Maryland, Rutgers, UCLA, Minnesota, Northwestern, Illinois, and Purdue is pretty much in line with the other rankings. But Indiana at number 10 in the Big Ten out of 18? Uh, no. 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 